We are ready for uh, our first speaker, which is the FBI presentation, Special Agent Raul Bohanda. Yeah, we got it right. Awesome. Am I talking to any speakers so everyone can hear me? Is everyone can hear me okay? Let's just move oh, that there, right there. Right? That's that like one big water bottle. <laughs> Fantastic. Let Thanks. us know if you can't hear us. Yep, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. I see most of you on the screen as well. So uh, thank you for having us. Thank you for having me and, and Frank here as well. Obviously, Frank, you all know Frank. He's our PIO. You make sure that we get the message for the FBI consistent and obviously always correct. So that is his primary focus to make sure that I'm saying the right things. Uh, I kind of see this as a fluid conversation. I've done this in a different region. And uh, so if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to stop and ask them. But I'm just going to start with a little bit as far as our relationship with APD and what we're doing on very common themes together. As you would expect, we are focused with them and partnered at the hip when it comes to violent crime. So violent crime is a big effort that the FBI has taken on here in the state of New Mexico. It's not what we would consider to be traditional mm -hmm. FBI work, but we understand this is the community that we live in and we have to be responsive to the community that we, that we are responsible for. We live in these communities. These are the communities where our kids go to school. These are the communities where we go and do our shopping just like the rest of you. We want to make sure that they're safe. We want to make sure that the FBI is doing their part to make sure that we are working together with our partners, in this case, APD, to make sure we're getting that mission across and we're making sure that the community knows what our efforts are and what our joint efforts are more than anything. We obviously work this in conjunction with our task force and it's a lot when now we're kind of separating it out, but it's still the same thing between the violent crime and the violent gang task force. And that is to go ahead and try to leverage each other's resources, manpower, and everything else that we bring to the fight to make sure that we're addressing violent crime and violent gangs within our communities. Obviously, our best effort is always going to be, and our best resource is always going to be the community themselves. The more that we have an open dialogue, the more we have an open conversation about how it is that we can improve things, the more effective we're going to be. We're going to be deaf tone and we're not hearing listening to our communities and hearing what their concerns are and not addressing them as they would like us to be addressing them. By the same token, we might be focused on one thing when maybe the community feels we should be focused on another. But if we have an open dialogue and open conversation, then we'll make sure we get it right. And we're going to get it right more often than we're not. So as far as the FBI goes, we have an interesting mission and in that we have dual mission. Besides our criminal threats, we also have national security, but we're also an intelligence-driven organization. So that means that we do the part that most uh, in other countries, that is a separate agency. We do it here in the one stop. It works for us because that intelligence drives what it is that we're actually focused on in whatever area of the country that you would want to mention. We have national security threats. Like you all know, we have two national labs here in Los Alamos and Sandia. So those are take up a lot of our time and a lot of our resources that you would expect them to. We want to make sure that those things that are happening there are protected and that the people that are working those, those specific areas and those specific technologies for the future are also able to do their jobs free of any harm, free of any threat, regardless if that's a threat both in the United States, which is domestic or anything that's international, that's driven by any kind of state-sponsored actor. So, as far as the makeup of how we go ahead and accomplish this. So here in Albuquerque, our office is the headquarters. And throughout the state, we have five what we call resident agencies. They're just smaller offices that have a smaller footprint, but they also cover parts of the state. Those would be in Santa Fe, Farmington, Gallup, Roswell, and Las Cruces. In here at Headquarters City, we have our largest contingent of agents, and this is kind of where everything comes out of, right? This is where we keep all the big bells and whistles but we deploy those throughout the state as needed. And uh, there was one good example that I heard a different agent give a presentation to a bunch of the school teachers. And I think this was a good kind of a way of looking at it. You know, the FBI may not always be the first to, to a problem, whether it's a crime incident or name the threat. But once we get there, we're there for the long haul and we won't leave until it's done. So we do, once we do arrive, we bring a whole lot of resources to the table. And our job is to make sure that we're not going anywhere until it's time. And those resources might not come here from the state of New Mexico within our office, but they come from somewhere across the country. 
through our 56 field offices, one of which is Albuquerque. It's real simple for us here in the state because one office, we cover the whole state, and we don't have to compete with any other field office to do our job. We have one U.S. Attorney's Office. Everything that we prosecute on that end, that is their responsibility. We work jointly with them. We have a great partnership, and so does APD. And for the most part, there's nothing really that they will not say yes to. They do the job just like we do it. We do it for the right reasons. So I just want to touch a little bit on kind of some of the themes that I've been really pushing out at different venues. And one of them has to do with school violence and the other has to do with cybersecurity. I want to start with cybersecurity because when down to school violence, it's a very passionate, very close to the heart kind of theme for all of us, right? Especially what happened with one day. But in cybersecurity, that is something that we hope to change some of the messaging. Uh, a lot of businesses, whether it's small, large, whatever it is, or individual citizens, what we want to try to change as far as in the way people approach cyber scam, cybersecurity, ransomware, denial of service, is that the first call should always be to that individual or that department that is going to go ahead and mitigate your, your threat that it just impacted your system, right? You want to get back into your IT system. There's nothing that we do today to include this meeting. We wouldn't, if we didn't have IT, we wouldn't be able to have this. If someone were to come in and give us a denial of service, we'd be done. Right? We'd only be us here in the room. So after you make that first initial call to the person that would try to remedy that, that problem for you, the second call should be to the FBI. Because the FBI is constantly looking, and not only are we looking, but we're gathering, like you said, we're an intel agency. We're gathering information for all these threat actors whose main goal when it comes to cybersecurity is to make a profit. In some instances, when we're talking about state-sponsored actors, whether you got name the actor that you want to mention, their, their purpose is to disrupt, right? They want to make sure that they, they impact our critical infrastructure, but for others in the main majority to include some of those state-sponsored actors is to make a buck. But since we are seeing these threats and these attacks across the country, we've learned from them, we learned their patterns, and in many cases, even their decryption keys, right? So they come and encrypt your system through a ransomware attack, regardless of how they got into your system, you might actually have that key. So the one thing that I would just want to message to everyone, whether it's a private citizen or a company or small or big, is if you contact us, you'll have us there soon. And I'm going to say hours or minutes, so we'll be there soon. And we're going to work through that problem together. Because together we might already find out that we can give you some strategies and some techniques that we've seen somewhere else that they worked. And and if it helps you mitigate your problem, that is a good day for all of us. You know, on your worst day, we are at our best. So if you give us that opportunity, you'll see that we'll be able to take this threat like we've addressed any other threat throughout the years and see that you will be successful and we've been very successful, especially in the state of New Mexico, recovering millions of dollars, killing some of that money before it hits its final destination, before the money is lost, and recuperating those funds to those victims. And a business is a victim just like an individual would be. So for those, please continue to forward that information to the FBI, whether you call it in at 1-800-CALL-FBI or, or at fbi.ic3.gov. That's where we take most of our individual internet type related complaints. But you got to get that information to us. Tips.fbi.gov, that works as well. Follow us on Twitter. Anyway, please call your favorite agent that you know in the office because that's, that's key to all of us. Uh, going, what are we doing? Uh, too, and I'm, I think I'll even touch on a little bit on MMIP and some of the efforts we're doing there. But I'll start with Uvalde. So if, if that didn't raise awareness, if that didn't impact you in some way, give you some kind of emotion, then you probably don't have a heartbeat. So the FBI is going to do our part, and we're not going to wait around for the state to kind of come on board or any other entity for that matter. I already know, talking in this forum right now, that APD is on board 100% because their task force officers, their officers are task force officers within our building, and they're super excited. What we're going to try to do before the school year starts is try to provide some training, some awareness to the educators, to the actual teachers that will be back in the classroom so that they know techniques, what to look at as far as threat populations. And their threat population is going to be that student population. We're going to give them some tips as things that we've seen share what it is that we know already. We're also gonna talk about things that they can do if an attack does happen, what they should expect from law enforcement, and some of the things that they should try to implement and educate their students in case of a threat or attack. No different than you see in other states that have to prepare and be ready for when a tornado hits. 
Unfortunately, this is something that's happening that often that we have to be able to address and be concerned about. But more importantly, we want them to know what the law enforcement response is gonna be. And we don't want them to be standing on the other side of the door when there's an active shooter that we're gonna knock down that door. We also want them to know exactly what it is that we're thinking about because we wanna eliminate that threat as quickly as we possibly can because those children on the other side are our children. I have a 12 year old son, he goes to schools here. This is very personal to me. If it's not personal to you, like I said, you're gonna have a hard time. We wanna do this collectively throughout the state, but if the state doesn't get on board, then we'll go one by one with our partners already on board and we'll hit as many of the school districts as we possibly can. Obviously this training is always like everything else that we do, as far as the FBI does, we have charge. You already pay us for your taxes, so thank you very much. <laughs> but this is what we'll continue, continue to do. This is our commitment. And, uh, and I hope that this also gets the community getting the message out, because it's twofold, right? So we're gonna be very vocal and, and and obvious about what it is that we're doing in the schools. We're also sending a message to those would-be attackers on the road. And there, there, we can talk about them. If we, were, if we all had a clearance, sorry, but if we did, we could talk to them. Those threats exist here in the state of New Mexico. But we want to send a message to them as well. That if you do this, it's not gonna end well for you. We are preparing for you. We're gonna make sure that that doesn't happen here. We're gonna try everything possible we can. And unfortunately, it's one of those that you see in many cases like in Buffalo and in Valde, they happen too often. But if we can be better, there's things we've already learned and we'll continue to continue to make that effort and you'll have our commitment on percent now. And the last thing is on MMIP. Done a lot of efforts and work throughout the state. I've been here now officially a little bit over a year. And the one thing that we wanted to do is to do our part that was not only coming up with a solution or a strategy, but something that permeates and goes past any of my time and anyone else's. And I think one of the biggest pieces that the FBI does very well and has done for many years is that the resources just weren't there. Everyone was doing the right thing in their own way. The one piece is that was missing is that collectively we didn't have the one place to put everything in. So we just kind of used our same resources and are continuing to use our resources to make sure to bring everyone's data on individuals categorize it and put it in such a way that makes sense to anyone that queries that information, whether it's law enforcement or, or anyone that would have a need to know and have access to that, so that we can not only provide the right information so we can find these individuals, in some cases open up investigations if that needs to happen, but more than, more than importantly is to have and bring closure to those families that have been impacted for so many years. And we're almost there. In the upcoming months, we'll be having a training session throughout the state to not only teach what it is that we built and how it is to access the tool, but also to have the input from all the different law enforcement agencies so that they know how to use it and how maybe some things we might have missed because this eventually not only will impact and be provided as a resource for the state of Mexico, but for the country. Because like everything else, people don't have boundaries. People will not only leave the state, but go to other states, but they might also even leave the country. And we'll make sure that that information is captured in such a way that it really kind of starts to bring the closure that we're looking at. To include, if your loved one might be missing for a long time, but they might have had an encounter with some local law enforcement agency somewhere up in Colorado, we'll know about that. And then it'll be our, our responsibility to reach out to that agency and say, make that connection with the family members and bring closure to that. That's on a kind of a simplest level. And in some instances, we might have to bring some bad news, but that's okay because that at least brings closure and a solution to something that right now seems to have no, no presence, seems to have in so many uh, instances, I've talked to different families, it's, you know, there's deafness, there's nothing being heard or said on the other end, and I totally get it, because I wouldn't want to be in that situation. So that's all I have. We can talk about many different other things. I have a lot of different notes that, uh, Frank provided me, and I have a lot of different topics that are in my head, but I will definitely open up for any questions. Did I hear correctly the abbreviation uh, MMPI or was it MMIP? MMIP. Murder, missing, and oh, Okay, that, that's what I got it back. Right on. No, thank you. <laughs> so I had a question like, how, how would a school reach out to you guys for that training? So, what we're hoping for is in the next couple of weeks, we're going to have, we're going to request an audience with the state. So with the Secretary of Education for the state. Oh, okay. And hopefully that they decide to go ahead and make this something else, part of the in-services that all of the school teachers will do before the day one of 
you know, when school starts again. <clears throat> if it doesn't work out that way, then I would say reach out to Frank. If you have a one-off schools and whatnot, if we're unable to get that kind of commitment, yeah. then we're still going to try to do that with the major school districts. Obviously, here APS here in our area, we're going to do the same thing down in Las Cruces, the same things up in Santa Fe, and those will be easier because they are smaller and there's less yeah. of those schools to reach a, a bigger uh, contingent of people. Uh, here is where it's a little bit harder, so that's why the commitment would be nice to dedicate that time because then you have all these other issues and concerns with unions and whatnot and so much time with training and whatnot. Yeah. But if they can make that so, we want to get in front of them. Yeah, and, right. and I only ask, and I'll get your card, Frank, because I'm in the governing council for Robert F. Kennedy Charter School. Okay. And a consultant has been reaching out, and if we can get it for free from the experts. Yeah, of yeah, you're, so what you what we're looking at putting together, so you have awareness, so we have a training called Stop the Bleed. That's not what you want to hear, but that is something yeah. that we want to try to put that that knowledge in the educators. That's what you do if something does happen. Get to know, yeah. Exactly, just to give them enough time so that people survive. Uh, you'll get to what we consider an alert training, but it's going to be more of the run hide fight with some kind of tactics and techniques that that you should that be training not only your staff, but in some instances even your your students that are in front of you. And, uh, and then we have also the resource work, a resource officer working group and what you can expect and should expect from them as well. And it should be a collaboration that's continuous throughout the year, but like the charter schools. Yeah. Uh, that's the one that really concerns me. The resource officers usually are not at the charter schools. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the way they do things are not necessarily dictated like you would want them from the district. So those are the ones we would want to kind of do as one offs to make sure that they know exactly and also just looking at how they can harden your system with the schools themselves. You know, things for people to think about. You know, we want to be, we are a trusting society. Yeah. And it's that trust that, you know, people take advantage of. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, especially, you know, what is your 800 number? It's 1 800 call FBI. <clears throat> Susie, you have your hand raised? I do. Thank you. Um, that was a great presentation. Thank you. And Angela, you stole one of my questions, so I'm glad I got it answered. Um, because we're, we work with a working group that works with schools. Um, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of us are <clears throat> over 30 and we don't um, always know some of the, you know, the new stuff that the kids know. So it's always good to know that there's training available. Um, so I'll definitely tap into that with Angel. Um, my question or my other question would be um, leading up to some of these large events that we're having over the summer, um, specifically, you know, we've got Juneteenth coming up. We've got, you know, all of the Summerfest events. Like, is that, do you work in conjunction with the city to, you know, keep us safe for, to simplify it? Yeah, so every event that we have in the city, in the state, we always partner with that agency that has a lead. And uh, we always offer our resources. Some of them is right from the get-go, so we're fine. So example, Balloon Festival, that's something that we're involved in from day one. Uh, other events that are coming up, we always, we're always looking for threat information and threat streams that may be coming up. So we want to make sure that we pass that information on to that department or the, that, uh, well, to that event coordinator so that they have that information that we're aware. And we're always gonna be involved, whether we're obviously just out in the front where we're very visible, or we're always working it behind the scenes. And at the same time, there's nothing that really doesn't happen. And I think uh, Luke would probably say the same thing as far as law enforcement in the state, but we don't do it together. Cool, thank you. And it, I mean, that is just ties a little bit and I just wanna to touch on the jurisdictional piece. So a lot of the things that are state local matters, uh, depending, except that anything having to do with children, that's a completely separate category. Like we're in 100%, we don't need anyone to invite us. But on Great. things that are strictly state and local matters, we technically need uh, an invite by that, that chief or that sheriff that kind of, even that governs. But usually that kind of works along the lines that I make the call as we're deploying and say, you need our help, correct? And I've never heard a chief or a sheriff say, no, you know, turn around and go back. Yeah, I know they're all keeping working hard to keep all of us as safe as what they can. Sure. Oh. 
thank you for being here. Uh, my question is really related to the large event public safety kinds of concerns that were just raised, and that is specifically as it relates to domestic terrorism. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got the, the January 6th hearing still going on right now. Uh, I think uh, domestic political terrorism has been identified as one of the major threats to the nation. Uh, what are we seeing in New Mexico? What are What's the FBI doing in New Mexico related to this? So that is a threat that is our responsibility. We monitor it consistently and every single day. Uh, we look at those trends that we see nationally on the national level. And the one good thing is that we're not seeing in other places that we're not seeing the same thing in the state. Does it mean that that threat doesn't exist? It means that we know who those individuals are. It means that we are making sure there's, there's always a fine line what is a protected right you know we all have the right to say whatever it is we want to say whether we think it's offensive whether we agree with it or we don't agree with it that's what makes that domestic terrorism is that we have a felony charge that we can apply and is there a violence that's insinuated or acted upon that makes it directed at domestic terror a lot of these like actors know to kind of fall on that fringe or they push that line but they never cross the line that doesn't mean that by any less are we not concerned we are concerned we're always looking for individual sources of information to make sure that we stay on top of this, this threat and it doesn't happen here. Uh, doesn't mean that we can't have other actors come from outside the state and impact this as well. But again, because as a whole, the FBI is not in isolation working. It's not just in Mexico, it's, a, it's the country itself. So anything that they would see, whether it's on social media or, you know, or actually through sources of information, they would pass on that information and somehow it's from day one. As far as what's happening in the state right now, as of this moment, we don't have any active threats, domestic threats that we'll be concerned about. Doesn't mean that we wouldn't down the road, but at this moment, there's nothing that we're active Thank you. Mm -hmm. so, not sure where we are standing in terms of time. I think the first 20 minutes was all the intro and stuff like that. And uh, you've got about 15 more minutes, uh, according to I watch calculations. I, I do have a, a, a personal experience to share about somebody who uh, caused quite a bit of consternation in our neighborhood, riding around and shouting at people that he deemed as being liberals that they were gonna die. And it started escalating. You're gonna die and I'm gonna be the one to do it. And pretty soon, he was actually threatening to kill like me, my wife, my autistic granddaughter, made her cry. Uh, and so we did have a discussion with uh, Mender Langwood's predecessor, Mender Yara, right? Uh, and I uh, had a, uh, you know, probably about a dozen people talk this through and, and, uh, we're pretty satisfied with the, the uh, result because APD then sent out CIT to talk to the person and then they continued to have welfare checks to make sure he was on his medication. He, he was autistic himself. Sure. And uh, that was just a, an irony, but uh, what I was going to share start with was that I did call the local FBI mm -hmm. office and I told them the situation and uh, I have somewhere in my notes the name of the agent I talked to but she said report it first to APD which is what we did and we had the meeting with Commander Yara uh, and then if there's a federal nexus you know, domestic terrorism as opposed to emotional imbalance and maybe some drug use and so forth uh, that anyway the, the uh, APD intervened and it seems to have, have died down there and I've asked around the neighborhood to see if he's driving around shouting stuff and, and uh, it's it's diminished so you know you I can call like what year that was and I'm just curious uh, it was in uh, early January 20, when was the election? 2020? Yeah, it was right around the first part of January 2021. Before January 6th? 
it was right in there. Okay. <clears throat> so we've changed a little bit of our processes. Uh, we now have one of ABD CIT officers within our, what we call our guardian squad. And the guardian is just a mechanism that we use to take in all this information that is being reported to us via 1-800-TELL-FBI or any other means, tips.fbi.gov, IC3, all that information is coming to us. And then it gets routed to the respective field office, right? It's a 1-800-number, it's a call center that's out in West Virginia, and it makes sure that it comes to us. So when that information comes to us, the one thing that we do differently now that which we would consider a threat to life because it's literally making a threat to your life or to the lives of your family, is that instead of doing that kind of handoff, we would go in and reach out as well. We would take the APD uh, CIT officer with us or similar resources and do exactly what APD did for you, but do it together because they're already a part of that, right? That was part of our, how do, can we make this better? How can we be more effective? How can we stop some of what you got to begin with, which is call someone else? We don't want to get in the business of that anymore. We're actually moving away from that where I don't want people to kind of figure out on their own, is this a state matter, is this a local matter? Or is this something for the FBI to deal with? Just call us and let us figure that piece out. And then we will contact that agency. Now, if something's happening right now, crime is happening, we call 911, just like we would with anything else. And after the fact, we will coordinate with that local agency. There's a federal nexus, it's something that we should be involved in. But when it comes to something that's that kind of uh, it's not really a threat right now, but I'm not sure what it is that I have. Let's not try to figure out, just give us a call. We'll figure it out and we'll make those contacts to include that if it ends up going back just to APD, it was still contacted, those are still addressed and we would still do the same things that was done. But this way you don't have to worry about who do I call first. But we waste a lot of time and in some of these instances, time is of the essence. You cannot, you know, it just somewhat doesn't seem like that big a deal. And then we find out it was. And that's cross for any threat would be. If you're not sure what it is that you have, just be smart. Okay. So, um, John Topstack does have a question from cities of New Mexico have FBI offices. So, it's uh, here in Albuquerque is your headquarters Santa Fe, Roswell, Farmington, Gallup, and Las Cruces. Thank you. Are there other questions from anybody? Attendees, uh, our panelists. There's something in the chat. That's the first. Oh, okay. okay. So <clears throat> I think you touched on a question that I was going to ask, and that is uh, it, it sounds like you are reviewing law enforcement's coordination of their response to things like Uvalde and, uh, and uh, Buffalo. Right. Uh, so I was happy to hear that, that you're, you're in discussion with APD, among others, about what were the lessons learned in terms of, uh, and, and maybe were there critical differences in how law enforcement coordinated the responses in Uvalde versus uh, Buffalo. Sounds like Buffalo was more immediate and took, took action right away and stopped it pretty fast. Right. We don't have a whole lot of details as to because it's still an ongoing investigation of Uvalde. Uh, hopefully, we got more details about it. Uh, different types of scenario, and it's always kind of hard to kind of figure out what was that law enforcement agency or the law enforcement presence thinking in the moment of. But what I can talk to is our response, and I know that our response is very similar to what APD's response is because we train together. The Mexico State Police, we train together. Bernardino County, we train together. So I know what their tactics and their protocols are because they're very similar to ours, which is we're not, once we deploy, we relinquish that control to mitigate that threat. So at that point, it's those been individuals that are responding. If I'm driving by an instance and it's at a school, then it's on me. And I hope I have a friend that shows up, but I'm telling you, I'm not gonna be waiting for it. I decided that this is a career that I wanted to do. This is a commitment that I wanted to make to my community. I'm going in. I'm going in with whatever I can, whether it's a chair or whatever I have on my side, and I hope I have enough bullets. But that is going to be our response. It would be the same response for any crimes as well. Now, if you have more of a resource, then you take a more deliberate approach, but it's still a very forward leaning, very kinetic approach towards that threat. Once you eliminate the threat, then you can assess 
you know, what is it that I, are my next steps? You know, how is it that I'm going to go ahead and start to process the scene? How is it that I'm going to start to notify the families of the victims? How is it that I'm going to address the victims themselves and get them out of the setting? And at the same time, thinking about the investigative piece, right? Because at some point, you want to make sure that someone pays for the crime that just happened. It's a layered approach. There is no one step or two or one should happen over the other. It's a matter of how that situation unfolds. I think Frank made it well when he was talking to PIOs this morning down in Las Cruces is that when these things happen, it's chaos. And it's uh, as much as you want to say, we learn from this past setting, and this is how we're going to do it. We, we definitely got to be better and be more effective in our strategies. But yet we still don't know what it is that's going to be because every one of these situations and each one of these scenarios is going to be completely different. But we will, because we have the overall idea of what it is we want to accomplish, we'll get it done. And I presume in general, you do not want to reveal all the details of if this, then that, if that, then this other thing. And then because it comes if, if you were to reveal those kinds of policies and procedures and how you train, then somebody could use it to, to get around the weaknesses. True. I mean, the part of it, and the other part is also sometimes we're looking at these, these threat actors, they, they might sell, they might be juveniles. And there's a lot of different restrictions on what it is that we can and cannot say when it comes to juveniles, even if it is someone that just considered, just committed mass murder. But yeah, as far as our techniques and strategies, I mean, I'll vocalize the one which is we're gonna get you. <laughs> How I end up doing it, you know, it's my business. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Were the four of you back there able to hear everything that was, and how was the audio uh, for those of you joining by Zoom? I mean, to do a little bit back. Okay, if there are no further questions or comments, and you don't have anything else that you want to share at this time, anything else, Frank? You say no. All right. <laughs> okay.